Let me tell you what my deep research and basically vision is. I hope there's Bigfoot. I don't think there is. I'm not telling you nothing. <laughs> the aliens won't way. let it happen. <laughs> Happening now, breaking. And Bernie Sanders is a bear beats Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> what are the tips? Give me some tips on how to work with Wes Anderson. Um, be ready to speak very fast and very <laughs> clearly because that's definitely one key thing. Until you and six kids you barely know in wet bathing suits have surrounded nine chimpanzees outside of a Wendy's, you probably really don't know yourself, okay? Yep. And we back. Hello and welcome. You're listening to your new favorite podcast and the best in political sports and paranormal news coverage. I'm your host, Wes Anderson, and this is In the Shed. This is episode 42, so whether you're back for more or finding us for the first time this week, hey, thanks for tuning in. It's late Wednesday night, June 22nd, and I am in a shed in the backyard of my home in Alabama. Also, I can hang out with you tools and talk about the latest headlines, stories, and rumors in the world of politics, sports, and the paranormal. Episode 42, my babies, um, a.k.a. the Jackie Robinson Special. (laughs) Uh, I say that because Jackie Robinson was, of course, number 42 and one of the greatest uh, baseball players in history. Um, But I digress. This is the Father's Day episode. Um, I wanted to have this episode out on Father's Day, uh, but alas, here we are a few days later. This has become a tradition on In the Shed with Wes Anderson. I don't know if something can qualify as a tradition if you've only done it once before, but this is our second time, so... um, I guess this is a tradition, Uh, the Father's Day episode. Uh, There are tens of people across the globe that look forward to this episode, so here we are. To all of you fathers, stepfathers, bonus dads, father figures, grandfathers, um, stand-ins, uncles, single dads, to all of you dads out there, uh, whatever that may look like for you, I hope that you had a terrific Father's Day. And I know for some of you listening, Father's Day can be a very hard day, uh, either because you're grieving the loss of your father earlier this year or because you have had a difficult relationship with your father. Maybe you didn't have a father. Um, For those of you that Father's Day is a tough day, uh, my prayers and good vibes and thoughts go out to you. Understand, believe, and know that you are enough. You're enough, my babies. I'm certainly thankful for my father, uh, my greatest role model in life. Um, thankful for my my one grandfather that I do have, my papa. Um, thankful to be a father. Thankful for the opportunity to raise children who know that they are loved, um, who are poured into, um, who are uh, taught to be a source of light and positivity in the world around them. And uh, I had a good Father's Day. Um, wasn't necessarily a banner day like last year. If you remember um, the Father's Day episode last year, I talked about how my daughter, who was five at the time, gifted me an entire watermelon uh, <laughs> for Father's Day. She gave, she know her daddy liked watermelon. She gifted me an entire watermelon. I had that thing wrapped in everything. Um, but I did have a good Father's Day this year. Uh, it was exactly what I needed it to be, what I wanted it to be. Started off by going to church and uh, getting to sit with some kids that um, aren't my kids, but are my kids, if you know what I mean. Um, Some kids that mean the world to me. Got to sit with them in worship on Father's Day, which was very meaningful. Uh, Came home, my wife made an awesome lunch, uh, exactly what I wanted. I opened gifts from the kids. I got to take a two-hour power nap. Thank you, Lord. And concluded the day um, by making some steaks for the family 
in my cast iron skillet and getting to have some quality time together, which we don't often get to do on the weekends. I work a lot on Sundays, and uh, I was thankful for that. So it was a good Father's Day for us and for me, and I hope it was for you as well. I feel like the role of a father is one that um, often gets overlooked as far as its importance, but man, it's so critical in the development of a child, um, in the development of a young lady's knowledge of how she's supposed to be treated by the opposite sex, Um, in the development of a young man learning what it means to be a man, uh, what it means to be a man of responsibility, a man who is strong but who is also tender-hearted and kind, and showing your children that are raised up under your roof what it looks like for a mom and dad to love each other, to be committed to each other, to live life with integrity. And so I, I try my best. I am a man who makes mistakes daily, but I'm trying my best to raise my children that way, to be a good father for them, a good father figure for others who are in my sphere of influence, And it means the world to me. Being a father, being a father figure is one of my favorite things in this world. I do not take it lightly. And uh, to all my dads out there, just understand, your number one job is to show up daily. To show up daily. Show up for your kids. You're not going to get it right all the time. You're not going to be perfect. You're not always going to have the patience that you need to have. But show up. Be present when you're with your children. Make time to play with them. Even when you get home from work and you're tired and you're worn out and you're stressed to the max over bills, make time to throw the ball in the yard. Make time to play hide-and-go-seek. Make time to read bedtime stories. Sit down and have meals together. And don't be afraid to invite others into your circle. There's a lot of kids out there that don't have men to look up to. They don't have father figures in their life. And if you are a man that is a man of integrity, uh, it's not enough just to raise your children. Uh, You also got to be willing to put yourself out there and to look out for those and um, take folks under your wing that may not have fathers in their life. And uh, that's what Father's Day is all about to me. And uh, it was a good Father's Day. On last year's Father's Day episode, we gave uh, our top five reasons to being a father absolutely rips. And we also gave you our top five dad jokes. Um. The reasons that being a father rips, those are still the same this year, but I thought that we would keep the tradition running and uh, we give you five more dad jokes, our top five dad jokes for 2022, and here they are. Number five, I told my wife she needed to start embracing her mistakes, so she hugged me. She hugged me. (laughs) Number four, why does Waldo wear a striped shirt? Because he doesn't want to be spotted. He doesn't. He doesn't want to be spotted. So he wear. He wears. <laughs> he wears striped shirts. Number three. Did you hear about the cheese that's been working out? Dude is shredded. These are so bad. Uh, Number two, what did one hat say to the other hat? Stay here. I'm going on ahead. He said, I'm going on ahead. Could he a hat? (laughs) And our number one dad joke for 2022 What is Whitney Houston's favorite type of coordination? And I... (laughs) It's hand-eye. Hand-eye coordination. Whitney Houston, her hand-eye coordination. coordination. Those Those are our top five dad jokes right there. Um... I'm sure you have better dad jokes than that list. That's what I could come up with. Um, With a simple, basic Google search and uh, about five minutes uh, worth of time. Email the show at intheshedwithwes at gmail.com and let me know what your favorite dad joke is. Uh, Top my five. Give me one that is better. Um, If you send them in, I will read them on the next episode. All right, enough of that. Let's get to some comments and corrections. Our humble little show is now being listened to in 27 countries across the globe, and we're closing in on 5,000 downloads, currently averaging more listeners per episode 
than ever before. If you keep listening and sharing this show, we'll keep growing this thing together. I also want to give a special shout out to the Netherlands and our nine new listeners there this week. Welcome aboard, Netherlands. Did you know that you can now support our beautiful bald eagle of a show in two ways financially? That's right, you can. The first way to support the show is by sending $4 into the show via our cash app, which is The Wes Anderson, no spaces, all one word, The Wes Anderson. And in return, we'll send you our weekly newsletter, the best way to keep up with the show between episodes. If you send me $4, I'll keep giving you the news, and as long as you send $4 a month, you will get the best newsletter going. We're now up to 21 subscribers there. Don't miss out. The other way to support this show is by downloading the Mercari app, that's M-E-R-C-A-R-I, finding our In The Shed account, and buying one of our items. If you message us before purchasing, we'll even give you a 10% discount just for listening. We've got an assortment of autographed items, movies, books, and a load of collectibles. We've got a great show for you tonight, but first let's get us some listener emails Our first email comes from Ashley from Ohio who writes, Wes, I really enjoyed the episode featuring your wife. I grew up in a similarly toxic environment. I found her story encouraging and powerful. Thank you for writing into the show, Ashley. Uh, I could not agree with you more. Um, I just was proud. Um, I was just proud that my wife would come on the show, that she would be that vulnerable, that she would share um, her story with you. Um, she's overcome a lot. She's the most remarkable and resilient person I know, and um, I thought that that was one of our better episodes. If you haven't heard it yet, it's our last episode, episode 41 of the show, featuring my awesome wife, Charcy Anderson. And if you look in the show notes, you can find where to check out her blog online as well. Our next email comes from Matt from Dallas, who says, Wes, your sports coverage has been exclusively basketball for several episodes. What happened to football? Um, hey, Matt. Um, yeah, uh, there was this thing called March Madness and um, then the NBA playoffs. So, yeah, we focused on basketball. Um Football is in the offseason, but hey, we did put out our In the Shed with Wes uh, top 10 NFL quarterback rankings a couple episodes ago, and uh, we're going to be getting into more football in the next couple weeks. Uh, The next week or two, we'll be focused on NBA draft and offseason, and then we'll start breaking down college football previews, NFL previews. Um, You're from Dallas. You're ready for some Cowboys coverage. I get it. Uh, You can watch First Take, um, Undisputed. They'll talk Cowboys. 365 days a year. That's not us. Uh, But we will talk football soon. Uh, It's almost football season. We can't wait. We do love football. And uh, thanks for listening and writing into the show, Matt. And finally, Jai from Portland writes, Wes, just started listening to the show. I found it on Spotify by accident. And I think you're a fair bit more conservative than I am. But you're also fair-minded. I dig it. Thank you so much, Jai. I appreciate you saying that. Um, I think that's how everybody everybody finds our show. Uh, Unless you're in India. Uh, If you're in India, you probably heard about In the Shed from my boy Ramesh, who is our number two fan behind Meemaw. Um, But yeah, a lot of people find the show by accident and um, wind up listening to the show, becoming a tool, hanging out with us in the shed. So uh, I hope that you will do so as well. It's funny that you say I'm more conservative than you are. I hear every week how I'm more conservative than some. I'm more liberal than others, yada, yada, yada. Um, I'm an independent, and uh, this is a news show, but it's a different type of news show. Um, We are not interested in partisan politics or um, the R or the D beside your name. We just try to give it to you straight. We just try to say, hey, this is the stuff we're noticing Um, These are the things that are happening, and uh, we trust that you are smart enough to take it from there. Thank you for listening to the show. I'm glad that you enjoy it. That's all the listener emails this week. If you have any thoughts that you'd like to share, you can email the show at intheshedwithwes at gmail.com. Again, that's intheshedwithwes at gmail.com. I might even read it on air. All right, let's switch to this. Let's get to the news in the world of politics. 
and let's hit the headlines. Money, not COVID, is this summer's biggest travel hurdle, writes InfoWars. Biden wants money to fend off second pandemic, says all American babies should get COVID vaccine, reports the Post Millennial. Bully pulpit fizzles for Biden, says The Hill. From The Guardian, at least a thousand people killed after 5.9 magnitude earthquake in Afghanistan. And finally, the Uvalde school police chief has been put on administrative leave. And that is according to BuzzFeed News. Our first story in the world of politics, strange trend of food processing plant fires appears across the U.S. The fires began showing up regularly in the news after a fire closed a Tyson Foods meat processing plant in Kansas in 2019. The location was a primary beef processing location for the company and the U.S. supply chain providing about 6% of U.S. beef. After the fire, analysts began speculating that the impact could drive up market prices for meat nationwide. Dan Norsini, part of the beef and poultry trading market, said the cattle market would likely respond negatively to news of the fire. He said the long-term impact would depend on how long the plant stayed closed. Then in August 2021, the Patak meat processing facility burned near Atlanta. The media took notice because the family-owned business is loved in its community locally, and its products are purchased nationwide. The fire in Georgia barely had a minor impact on the food supply chain nationwide, but in September, a fire at JBS USA, a meat processing facility in Nebraska, threatened the meat supply for the entire nation profoundly. The plant reportedly processes about 5% of the nation's beef, and closure would directly impact the supply chain. The trend has continued repeatedly through the end of 2021 and into 2022. In February, Shearer's food processing plant in Hermiston, Oregon burned down, leaving two employees injured. On April 13th, Taylor Farms food processing plant in Salinas, California burned and prompted evacuations. On April 19th, headquarters of Azure Standard food processing plant in Defer, Oregon also burned. People are beginning to notice because the fires are threatening an already stressed supply chain of food in the U.S. The trend continues. On March 16th, a massive fire wiped out much of a Walmart fulfillment center in Plainfield, Indiana. The event was severe enough to warrant the ATF to investigate. Another incident occurred on April 11th at New Hampshire's East Conway Beef and Pork when a fire so large broke out that it took respondents 16 hours to distinguish. At least 16 such disasters have taken place at food processing facilities nationwide. While most of the incidents have shown no foul play after investigation, the trend presents a curious string of events across the country. It remains to be seen what the direct impact will be. Still, as the nation continues to face soaring food prices and trouble with supply chain operations, there could be a significant impact on the cost and availability of food to Americans. So, there have been quite a few fires at food processing plants across our country. Um, and the reason that this is alarming is because of the supply chain issues and the shortages that we're already facing in a time of extreme inflation, with inflation reaching almost 9%, um, gas prices and energy crisis uh, occurring at the same time, economic pundits starting to wonder if we are on the road to a recession during a time in which the war between Russia and Ukraine is affecting things over here coming out of an international pandemic as well. Kind of a combustible recipe. Um, I've been sent this story uh, no fewer than a dozen times by you, our listeners, and so I finally made the availability to discuss it on the show. And to be fair, I don't know what it means. I don't know what it means. The article itself says that uh, after investigation have not included foul play, So I think that in and of itself should put to bed some of the more extreme conspiracy theories that I have seen around this story. Um, Theories that fires are purposefully being set to uh, weaken our food production and processing capabilities and to weaken our economy and um, our populace further. But on the other hand, um, it certainly is not good news and it certainly is alarming. Um... What I would like to know is, what are the statistics? Um, What are the numbers as far as uh, 
in a given year, typically, uh, with these facilities across our country, there are so many of them. Um, how many of them normally experience fires? Uh, is this really uh, a statistical anomaly? Is this par for the course? Um, is there really an uptick of fires that's going on? Because if so, then um, there may be more than meets the eye. It may not be a grandiose conspiracy, but there may be some things as far as procedurally, at a minimum, that are alarming and that could use a, a further look that need to be investigated. But we approach things with an open mind on this show, and in this shed, we give it to you straight. And without seeing further evidence, without seeing the statistics borne out, I don't know that this is a, a rare thing. I don't know that this is an uptick. Uh, it may turn out that this many fires at this point in the year is actually a low number. And that because of the types of things that happen in these processing plants, that this is just a normal part of business that every so often mistakes are made or things happen with machinery or there's electrical problems and this is just a part of doing business. I honestly do not know. But if nothing else, it is something worth mentioning. It's something worth noting, worth keeping an eye on. Um, I thought it was curious. I thought it was curious, and I would love to know what you think. Email the show at intheshedwithwes at gmail.com. Find us on Twitter at intheshed4, and let me know what you think. Is this something that we should be worried about? Is this something that's going to cause further harm to a nation that's already in the throes of production and supply issues and that's already experiencing shortages? I mean, when we're running short on baby formula... In the year 2022, in the United States of America, uh, there are some issues at play. What effect, if any, will these fires have on such issues? I'm not sure, but we will certainly keep an eye on it and an ear to the ground, and I would love to hear from you. At this point in time, I see no reason to panic further. I see no giant conspiracy that is unfolding before us. For our next story in the world of politics, Biden and Harris reportedly lunch together for the first time since March. President Biden sat down with his not-so-close contact, Vice President Kamala Harris, on Tuesday for what was apparently only their third private lunch this year and their first since March, Politico and NBC's Mike Momoli report. And if Mike Momoli reports it, then A, I'm inclined to believe it because his name is hilarious. And um, he has Memo in his last name, Mike Mamoli. Biden said shortly after his inauguration that he hoped to cultivate a similar relationship with Harris as the one that he forged with former President Barack Obama, thanks in part to regular meetings at the lunch table. So he wanted Harris to be his sidekick, his, go his goofy, folksy sidekick is what... <laughs> I, th I think that's what he's um, I think that's what he's saying there. And in 2021, that mission appeared to be going well. Biden and Harris lunched together 21 times, far more than the now three times this year per the president's public schedule. Previously, Deputy White House Press Secretary Chris Meager unsurprisingly dismissed any talks of distance between Harris and Biden as a result or symptom of their lagging midday dates. The president and vice president are in constant touch with each other, he said. And it's not as though Biden hasn't been busy with inflation, the war in Ukraine, and national tragedy after national tragedy. But surely such a steep drop-off in working lunches would have any vice president wondering, did the president call? So I thought that this was kind of an interesting article because it doesn't come from Newsmax, Fox News, the New York Post, the Daily Caller, Daily Mail, or one of these right-wing news organizations or blog sites. It's from left-leaning news organizations, and um, when a left-leaning news organization finds it noteworthy to share information such as this, it catches my eye. Uh, my ears perk up a little bit because these are folks that, in our age of hyper-partisanship, tend to want things to go well for the president and tend to want things to go well for the Democratic Party. And hey... I want things to go well for the president, too, because the president is the president of all of us. 
I wanted uh, President Obama to do well. I wanted President Trump to do well. I want President Biden to do well. And in four years, I will want President Harris or President DeSantis or whoever it is to do well, too, because they are the leader of our country. If the president is having success, it should mean that our country is doing well. So for a news organization that has shown that they have a vested interest in highlighting successes of the president and his cabinet, to just kind of drop in and say, hey, by the way, they're not really hanging out very much. Um, I find that to be noteworthy. I find that to be interesting. And if you are a Democrat, if you are a supporter, a voter of President Biden and Vice President Harris, if you voted for that ticket, this might should be a little bit concerning to you. In 2021, in the midst of a pandemic with a lot going on, they managed to have lunch together 21 times. And here we are about halfway into 2022, and that number has dropped to three times. This after uh, reports have come out from various news organizations about how Democrats are not so excited that the prospect of Joe Biden running for re-election in a couple years, with reporting and speculation out there that there's a lot of uh, chaos and instability in the vice president's office, and with poll numbers for both the president and the vice president that are absolutely abysmal. Um, At a bare minimum, it's not encouraging. At a bare minimum, it's not a good look. And it could be a harbinger of a disconnect present between Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, uh, between their view of what their role and what their job is as president and vice president, and of what's coming in midterms uh, for the Democratic Party. And most news organizations and outlets, whether they're right-leaning or left-leaning, are predicting that the Republicans will have a lot of success in the midterms, uh, will overtake both the House and the Senate. Um, on this show, we have said that I do not believe, and I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. Ask my wife. <laughs> but I do not believe that the Republicans are going to have this red wave and just have massive advantages in um, every part of Congress. I don't see that coming. Um, I do believe that they will take majority in both the Senate and the House. I don't think it will be as big a majority as is being projected. But even so, the fact that um, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris aren't even having lunch together when Joe Biden said, hey, this is one of my goals, This is one of my strategies uh, to project togetherness, to work together as a team, to have um, a certain type of relationship. Um, Hey, there might be some issues here. There might be some rough edges that need to be smoothed out. I think if I were Joe Biden at a bare minimum, uh, my public schedule would show that the vice president and I have lunch together on a weekly basis, even if it wasn't necessarily true. Um, my schedule would reflect such a thing because a lot of times, unfortunately, perception is reality. And that's certainly true for the American people in the way that they view their elected leaders. The communications director for the vice president is quoted as saying in this article that the president and the vice president are in touch regularly. Um, hey, that's great. (laughs) But when your poll numbers show that you're less popular than a colonoscopy, hey, maybe you should get together and do some planning, some strategizing. Maybe you should work overtime to make sure that you're on the same page. And maybe you should even pay attention and work to cultivate public perception leading up to the midterms. That's just my two cents. That's just my advice, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris. You can take it. You can uh, reject it. Um, But hey, my poll numbers are a little bit better than yours, and um, we grow in week to week over here in the shed. Uh, I know just by talking this way, I'm going to get some hate mail into the email address and in my DMs on Twitter calling me a hater, saying that uh, I am a Trump lover, blah, blah, blah. It happens every time. Every time we cover President Biden, his administration, it happens. Let me remind you, I am a registered independent. I did not vote for Joe Biden. I did not vote for Donald Trump. Um, Go back and listen to the show. When Donald Trump was in office, we had plenty to say about his shortcomings as well. And we have had some things to say positive about Joe Biden when he's done some things that are noteworthy. 
but we keep it a buck with you. And um, it's my belief that we need both the left wing and the right wing for this beautiful bald eagle of ours to soar. And it's no secret that Joe Biden has to step up his game in several ways in order for the Democrats to do well in the midterms and outperform expectations. And even if he wants to have a realistic chance at being elected president of the United States. Um, there's a lot of stuff happening. Inflation, gas prices, shortages, school shootings, war. A lot of stuff that Joe Biden can't just wave a magic wand and fix. But this is something that he could easily easily fix like hey just have lunch together have lunch in the same room chop it up about what's on your to-do list for the day take 10 minutes put it on your schedule just that you're together um have your staff meetings in the same room it would be good for morale it would be good for public perception and it might be good for the both of you and that's my two cents on it our next story in the world of politics Two former U.S. servicemen captured in Ukraine after absolutely crazy mission, says report. Two former U.S. servicemen were captured last week in the fighting outside Kharkiv, according to a report. Alexander Drukey, 39, and Andy Hun, 27, both from Alabama. And that's why we're talking about it on the show, Um, aside from the fact that uh, it is important news internationally. Um... I know and have been to both of the hometowns of these men. They are from my home state, and they have been captured by Vladimir Putin's troops, possibly dolphins. Uh, Vladimir Putin talks to the dolphins. It's true. You can look it up. We're taken prisoner during a fierce fight with Russian armor during the ongoing Ukrainian counterattacks in the nation's northeast, the British newspaper The Telegraph has reported. The Americans were captured after their 10-man squad ran into a much larger Russian force in a village outside Kharkiv, the newspaper said, citing an unnamed source who fought with the pair in a regular Ukrainian military unit. We were on a mission and the whole thing went absolutely crazy with bad intel, the source said. We were told the town was clear when it turned out the Russians were already assaulting it. They came down the road with two T-72 tanks and multiple armored personnel carriers and about 100 infantry, the source added. Drukey and Hun apparently got at least one shot off at a Russian vehicle, destroying it with a rocket-propelled grenade before their capture, because they're from Alabama. Drukey, a veteran of the U.S. Army, served in Iraq. His mother told the Telegraph that he had suffered from PTSD and was struggling to hold down a job before going to Ukraine. The U.S. Embassy has assured me that they're doing everything they can to find him, and that they're searching for him alive, not dead, Lois Drukey said. I'm doing my best not to fall apart. I'm going to stay strong. I'm very hopeful that they will keep him to exchange for Russian POWs. Hun, a former Marine, left to fight in Ukraine in April, according to Alabama ABC affiliate WAAY. The outlet reported that Hun put up $6,000 of his own money to finance the trip. I know there's a potential of me dying, he said at the time. I'm willing to give my life for what I believe is right, for what I've been taught is right, through really my eyes, Marine Corps, through God, and really just what is right. Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city, has been the focus of a successful Ukrainian counterattack in the past several weeks. Ukrainian forces have on at least one occasion pushed Russian forces back to the border outside Kharkiv, putting pressure on Russian supply lines into the Donbass. So... As I said, uh, I wanted to highlight this story. Uh, We're trying to give you um, developments that are happening in Ukraine um, that you might not be hearing uh, from mainstream media sources. Um, Things that uh, are interesting, things that affect us, things that we find to be important but that aren't being focused on or that aren't getting top billing. And uh, being that this humble show, this... um, Different kind of news show is brought to you every week from a shed in the backyard of my home in Alabama. I just wanted to take a time out to highlight these two guys. Um, An Army and Marine Corps veteran uh, who felt so strongly about what was happening between Russia and Ukraine that they put their lives on the line and they took it upon themselves to actually go there and take up arms alongside the Ukrainian people. 
And look, you can say what you want to about whether or not you think that was a wise decision. Certainly there are some pretty extensive inherent risks with doing something like what these gentlemen have done. But what you can't question is the courage that it takes to do something like this. Um, Because I know that I do not have the courage or the intestinal fortitude Um, Despite what I think of uh, what Vladimir Putin is doing in this war, um, however it's framed in mainstream media, to actually put my money and my life where my mouth is and to go there and fight alongside these people. um, Incredibly brave. And these are American citizens. These are uh, veterans. These are people who have fought for our freedom. Um... And these are men with families. These are men uh, with mothers and siblings and wives and friends. And I can't imagine what their friends and their family and their loved ones are going through at this time. Um, So if you are a praying person, um, I ask that you pray for these two gentlemen, for their their well-being, uh, for their safe return home, for their, their family, for strength and hope to prevail. And if you're not a praying person, whatever you do, uh, send good vibes, send good thoughts. Um, It's certainly a risky thing that they have done, um, and it hasn't worked out. Uh, For them to to be in a regiment of just 10 guys and to to roll into a town that they think is a safe zone, an area that they think is a safe zone, and to be met with multiple tanks and armored vehicles and 100-plus infantrymen... um, I can't imagine what that must have been like. And uh, I hope that they make it home safely. I know I have friends um, that are deployed currently. Uh, One of my very, very good friends, Robert, is uh, currently deployed to a place with a lot of sand. Um, And as far as I know, he has not been in direct conflict during this deployment. Um, But even so, I worry about him. Um, I pray for him. I I anxiously wait for him to return home. Um, I worry about his wife and his daughter. Um, And so I can't imagine uh, what it must be like for friends and family to see this reported in the news, to get a a call from the U.S. State Department. And and I hope they make it home safely. and I hope that they're being treated all right. And uh, and I hope this war comes to an end soon, man. Um, it's hard to make sense. It's increasingly hard to make sense of what's happening in Ukraine, between Ukraine and Russia. Uh, it's being framed so many different ways. You're hearing different conflicting reports. What I do know is that it's not really helping anybody. Um, war usually usually doesn't help very many people. And that's certainly the case. Uh, it's having an effect on on us back home as far as our economy and our energy and our foreign relations and our standing in the world. Uh, Certainly it's having the biggest effect on the Ukrainian people and even on the Russian people who didn't ask for this. Uh, Vladimir Putin is acting on his own accord. Uh, The Russian people didn't ask for this war either. And uh, I just hope that it's all over soon. And until it's not, we'll keep bringing you reports. Uh, We're going to try to keep an ear to the ground. We're going to bring you the parts of the war uh, that you're not getting elsewhere. And uh, this is certainly something that I thought deserved more attention. I just heard a noise um, outside the shed. And I thought maybe it was my black cat, Bernie. Named after one of my favorite comedians, Bernie Mac. Rest in power. Uh, sometimes Bernie tries to get on the show and he scratches the door of the shed or he meows. So I hit pause on the recording and I stepped outside the shed and it was an armadillo. (laughs) Have I mentioned that this show is recorded in a shed in the backyard of my home in Alabama? Because it don't get any more Alabama than having your podcast interrupted by a literal leprosy-carrying armadillo. And as soon as I noticed him, he ran into the sewer. (laughs) 
this might be my favorite moment of the show in 42 episodes. The time we got interrupted by an armadillo. Episode 42 will live in infamy. Our last story in the world of politics, Alaska school children were served floor sealant instead of milk at a child care program, school district says. That's right. Alaska school children were served floor sealant instead of milk at a child care program. Can you really call it a child care program? If you're serving the baby's floor sealant. I'm just saying. It it seems like it might be a child lack of care program. Uh, I think maybe DHR might should be involved in this. Because I've never drank floor sealant. But I doubt it has the same vitamins or strong bone-producing calcium as a carton of milk. I'm not saying. I'm just saying. Twelve elementary school children drank floor sealant, believing it was milk, after it was served to students at a child care program in Juneau, Alaska on Tuesday, according to the school district. Did I say Juneau? Isn't it, what is it, uh, Juneau? Juneau, Alaska, um, I think. Students in a summer care program at Glacier Valley Elementary School, that is the most Alaskan-sounding elementary school I've ever heard of in my life. Glacier Valley Elementary School, of course that is in Alaska, began complaining that the milk they were served as part of the program's breakfast tasted bad and was burning their mouths and throats the school district said in a statement on Wednesday. The breakfast was served on trays by an outside contractor, Nana Management Services, at about 8.45 a.m. on Tuesday, and the children brought their trays to a cafeteria table to eat, the district statement said. What are the odds? What are the odds that the management service They mistakenly serve floor sealant to children. Happens to be called Nana. (laughs) It's called Nana. Nana Management Services. Uh, That's about the worst Nana I've... (laughs) See, that's why in Alabama we have a Meemaw. Uh, Y'all need y'all a Meemaw. Uh, Meemaw would never be out here serving floor sealant to children. My gracious. After the children complained about the burning sensation, school district staff immediately followed up by smelling and tasting the milk and looking at the container label, the statement said. Um, just a question. Why smell and taste the milk then, <laughs> then look at the label? Uh, y'all need some, y'all need some better leaders in Alaska. Uh, because I... I would look at the label first. That would be where I started my investigation. Um, Somebody's like, hey, this thing is burning my throat. I'm not going to pour it down my throat as well to investigate. Okay. I'm going to take a look at what it is y'all people drinking. But not these people. Uh, Nana like, hey, let me have a smell. Let me have a taste. Hmm, this is fishy. And nah, read the label first. It was found that the milk, quote-unquote, served was actually a floor sealant that resembled milk. Staff immediately directed students to stop consuming the substance and removed it. The site manager for Rally, the Summer Care Program, or Summer Lack of Care Program, contacted Poison Control and alerted parents according to the statement, and all steps provided by Poison Control were carefully followed. Rally provides state-licensed child care for elementary students ages 5 through 12 and is a partnership with the Junio School District, according to the district website. My guess, my guess is not for much longer. They're not. One student received medical treatment at a nearby hospital, and two other students were picked up from school and may have gone to seek medical advice, the statement said. 
the condition of those students and the remaining nine children were not included in the statement. An investigation into how the incident happened is ongoing and includes participation from the school district, Nana, the city and borough of Juneau, and the Juneau Police Department, according to the statement, which did not specify who is leading the investigation. My guess is, not Nana, because Nana tasted the floor sealant instead of reading the label. Not very good investigative procedure. In a separate statement sent Thursday, Nana said it dispatched its safety team to Juno as soon as it became aware of the incident, and leadership are en route to Juno now. Y'all have a safety team? They they might should have been there ahead of time. Um, they should have been a part of the child care services ahead of time, apparently. We are supporting the full investigation, looking at every contributing factor to determine exactly what happened. This process is key to identifying potential safety measures and putting those safety measures to work. The Nana statement reads, um, Here's some safety procedure. Don't feed children floor sealant. That would take care of, of the whole problem. Um, Employ adults that read labels of what it is they're serving to children. Make better hiring choices. Um, These are all things that will fix your problems, Nana. So this is and probably should be a lawsuit. And I think in lieu of a monetary settlement, Nana should just be forced by law to change their name. Because you ain't nobody's Nana serving children floor sealant instead of milk. Like, you really can't tell the difference. Even if they both white and liquid and come in cartons. Hey, one of them says milk on the carton, okay? One of them is obviously and clearly something that should be ingested by children. And the other is a harmful and toxic chemical. It's not that hard. Uh, yeah, you should have to change your name. You should uh, no longer be allowed legally to call yourself Nana. Because you out here operating like nobody's Nana. And don't call yourself a child care facility. If you lack the most basic care for the children in your charge. And this is happening in Alaska. I feel so bad for these children feel bad for their parents. I would be going ham. Um, I would probably be in jail if this happened to my child. I, I'm being 100% serious. I'm keeping it a buck with you. I would probably be in jail. My wife would have to have the bail money ready, okay? Um, I get it. Accidents happen, but there's no excuse for something like this. All it takes is paying attention to what you're doing and what you're serving. And I feel bad that it happened in Alaska where it's always daylight. These children have horrible sleep cycles. They cold all the time. They out there with Sarah Palin not even connected to the rest of the United States. And now they serve some floor sealant for breakfast. It's hard out here for children in 2022. And it's harder out here for children in 2022 in Alaska. Being taken care of by the worst Nana ever. Do better, Nana. You are no Mima. That's all for the news in the world of politics. Let's switch to this, the news in the world of sports, and let's hit the headlines. I have no authority to remove Snyder as owner, says NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell. Blazers get Jeremy Grant from Pistons for draft pick. Rob Gronkowski officially retires for a second time. Lawyer says 20 lawsuits against quarterback Deshaun Watson have now been settled. Sharif O'Neal says Dad Shaq is opposed to his NBA draft entry. GM Bob Meyer says it's Warriors' goal to bring everyone back. Pat Connaughton opts in, deciding to stay with Bucks. And finally, Ohio State wins trademark right to the word the, as in the Ohio State University. This week in the world of sports, we want to focus on the NBA, and we want to start with the Golden State Warriors winning the NBA title over the Boston Celtics four games to two. The Warriors' fourth title in eight seasons 
with Steph Curry taking home the finals MVP, averaging 31 points, 6 rebounds, and 5 assists for the series. And look, I am a Warriors fan. Uh, If you follow me on Twitter, you know that. If you listen to the show, you know that. Uh, But this was a surprise. This was a surprise to me. It was a surprise to most of the sporting world. Um, With everything that the Warriors have been through over the course of the last three seasons, with Klay Thompson missing 900-plus days with injuries, with Steph Curry and Draymond Green getting older and being in and out of the rotation, uh, missing time with injuries themselves, with Kevin Durant opting to leave for Brooklyn, a lot of people thought that the Warriors would never reach the pinnacle again, and here they are proving everyone wrong. Coming into the NBA playoffs, I picked a rematch of last year's championship with the Suns playing the Bucks. I thought the Warriors might make the conference finals, but just didn't have enough to get by the Suns. And I was wrong. The Warriors won the NBA championship in dominating fashion, never once facing elimination in any series, beating all comers, and proving once again that they are the epitome of professional basketball. And there's a lot of things that can be talked about in looking back at this series and in the Warriors' playoff run to a title. Um, In this particular championship series, you could take a look at the Celtics, the fact that they had a tremendous season, that they outperformed all expectations. You can look at the fact that Jason Tatum was largely a no-show in the NBA Finals and performed disappointingly, or how the Celtics, even though they are a tremendously talented young team, really lack a championship caliber starter at point guard uh, Marcus Smart is just too inconsistent too up and down a tremendous defender um, but not the type of point guard you need if you're going to win a championship but to me the Warriors run and their win in the title series is all about three things culture curry and consistency it's about culture curry and consistency first it's about culture The Warriors are the epitome of doing things the right way. In an era of super teams, they largely have become good by drafting and developing their own players. It's true the Warriors did win a couple of championships with Kevin Durant as their lead player, but they also won a title before Kevin Durant, and now they've won a title after Kevin Durant. Golden State makes a habit of signing KG veterans to minimum contracts. They take guys that don't fit elsewhere and make them integral parts of their rotation. Uh, They're a team where everybody plays. They play 10 to 12 guys consistently, even deep into the playoffs. If you're going to play for Golden State, you have to play defense. You have to move without the ball. Everyone shares the ball. Um, Steph, Clay, and Draymond set the tone. And they're just a team that does things the right way. They're a team that's focused on one goal, and they're all pulling in the same direction. You hear a lot about heat culture, but when looking at the NBA, the culture that you want to emulate is the culture found in Golden State. This historic run by Golden State is also about Wardell Stephen Curry. This is the year of Curry. Steph Curry was top five in the NBA in scoring this year. He became the all-time NBA three-point leader. He set an All-Star Game record by hitting 16 threes en route to winning the Kobe Bryant All-Star Game MVP. He won the first ever Magic Johnson Western Conference Finals MVP award. He won his fourth NBA championship, his first Finals MVP, and possibly most impressive, even while doing all this, in addition to being a husband and a father, he graduated college with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Sociology, writing his senior thesis on advancing gender equity through sports. And since the Warriors have won the championship and Stephen Curry has taken home his first ever finals MVP, you're hearing a lot of storylines talked about in regard to Stephen Curry's performance and the implications of his performance in this year's finals. Is he a top 10 all-time player? Probably. Is his place in history greater than that of Kevin Durant? Um, absolutely. You're hearing talk of how his finals MVP has somehow cemented his legacy as an all-time great, as though uh, he needed that to do so. And all these things are speculative in nature. And they're all things that make for great fake debate on Undisputed and First Fake in the Morning. They're all things that work well from sports talk shows uh, that feature Stephen A. Smith yelling at the top of his lungs, 
uh, or when ESPN is trying to force feed Kendrick Perkins to us, uh, even though he's terrible at his job. But hey, can we just for a moment, just for a minute, can we stop projecting toward the end of the man's career and just focus on how good Steph Curry really is at the game of basketball and how blessed we are as fans to get to watch what he puts out there on the court. Because we we know all about his shooting, even in a season when his numbers as far as shooting percentages weren't as great as they typically have been. Uh, we, We know about his shooting, but it's the other things that Steph Curry does that make him great. It's the spacing that he provides for his team. He's the only player that has to be picked up immediately after crossing half court. He's the only player that you can find still shots, uh, four or five still shots from every game he plays where there's three and four guys surrounding him and everybody else on his team is wide open. It's about his movement without the ball. In modern NBA basketball, it goes Steph Curry, Reggie Miller, and Rip Hamilton. Those are the guys that have moved well without the basketball, and Steph Curry has taken it to another level. The amount of screens that Steph Curry as a star guard in the NBA sets the amount of uh, backdoor layups that he gets is incredible. It's about his quiet and resolute leadership. It's about his, uh, his ball handling, his ability to finish at the rim, the fact that he's a tremendous rebounder to be a six foot two point guard in the NBA. It's about his underrated passing and playmaking ability. He's an all-time great, folks. Even if he didn't win finals MVP, he's an all-time great. Even aside from the way that he's changed and shaped the way that the basketball is played, he's an all-time great. The best shooter in the history of the game, yes. But Steph Curry is so much more than that. And even at 34 years old, um, he's still playing at a high level. And he's still got uh, more basketball that will be played at a very high level. People talk about how Draymond Green is the emotional uh, heart and soul leader of the Warriors. People talk about how uh, Clay is the perfect sidekick. People talk about Steve Kerr's uh, impact on the roster. They talk about the way that Bob Myers has put a team together. Make no mistake, the engine that makes all of this work is Steph Curry. And he's a star unlike any other star that we have in sports today because he's a humble leader. He doesn't care what his numbers look like. He's not shot hunting. He's not out to get his. He's out to win. And he's a killer. Make no mistake about it. He's a babyface assassin. He's the closest thing that we have in the game to Michael Jordan. And people might balk at that because he doesn't have the natural athletic ability that Jordan had. But when it comes to raising the play of other people around you, when it comes to taking guys that don't fit elsewhere and making them legitimate NBA players, when it comes to demanding more from your teammates, when it comes to the level that the other team has to go in preparing for you offensively, Steph Curry is the closest thing we have to Michael Jordan today. It's not LeBron. It's not Jason Tatum. It's not Devin Booker. It's not Kawhi Leonard. It's not Giannis. It's not Luka. It's Steph Curry. He's an all-time great. He's an incredible player. And that moment when he pointed... Uh, up 18 in game six of the finals at his finger, as if to say put a ring on it. This is number four. Up 18 with plenty of time left in that game. That's an all-time iconic NBA moment. So yeah, it might be fun to talk about whether or not he's an all-time top 10 player, where he fits, yada, 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 yada. But let's just enjoy the basketball that the man has played right in front of us right now. And I gotta say, Steph Curry will never be known as an elite defender, but he just played his best individual defense of his career in the NBA Finals at age 34 because the Celtics continue to try to pick on him and isolate him. And if you look at the numbers, it didn't work out very well for them. What Steph Curry did in this year's NBA Finals was nothing short of remarkable He had one game where he only scored 16 points and I think had 10 assists, and people said, ah, maybe Andrew Wiggins gets the MVP. (laughs) 
they forgot that he had 43 points on the road in the Boston Garden the game before against the number one defense in the league. And he made sure in game six that there was no debate, dropping 34 points, averaging 31 points, six and five for the series. He's an all-time great. So the Warriors win the NBA title. It's all about culture. It's all about Curry. And it's all about consistency. Steph, Clay, Draymond, Kerr, Bob Myers, Looney, Iggy. The Warriors are all about consistency. In an era where teams are looking to just bring in stars and make big splashes and free agency and trades and all this different stuff, the Warriors have, have mostly stood pat. And I get it. Uh, you can talk about the Hamptons Five. You can talk about bringing in Kevin Durant. Look at what they've done before Durant. Look at what they're doing now. Look at how many of their most important pieces have stayed the course. Through injuries, through doubts, through ups, through downs. Having the worst record two years ago in the league winning 15 games. And to be back on top of the mountain. It's incredible. And it's culture. And it's curry. And it's consistency. And as long as they have those three things in place... Golden State will be a force to be reckoned with in the NBA. Not just next year, but for the years to come. I also want to talk about the NBA draft, which happens tomorrow night. I'm going to work hard to make sure this episode hits the airwaves before the draft happens. That way we can go ahead and give our NBA draft preview tonight. You can hear it tomorrow before the draft. And then after the NBA draft, we'll hit you up with what actually happened. But I want to talk a little bit about the NBA Draft. I want to give you our In the Shed with Wes NBA Draft preview. And I want to talk about the top 10 picks in this year's draft. And usually how it works in an NBA Draft preview and on these draft boards is so-called experts will give you who they think each team is going to pick. How they think things are going to unfold. Doesn't really move the needle for me. Doesn't really interest me. Because honestly, nobody really knows what's going to happen for sure. The intel that these teams are giving out is not correct and accurate information, okay? They're holding their cards close to the vest as they should. They're saying we might be interested in this guy or maybe this guy or maybe this guy and people are just doing their best to throw a top 10 together. So instead of just doing that, which is what everyone else is already doing, I thought we'd do things a little bit different. I'm going to give you the top 10 picks, not as I think they probably will happen, but as I think they should happen. So these aren't the top 10 picks based on necessarily the best fit for each team's roster or who I think they're going to pick or what is uh, most likely to occur. But this is our NBA draft preview, the top 10 picks as I think they should happen based on talent, based on who are the best players in this year's draft. The number one pick this year goes to the Orlando Magic, and I think they should take the forward Jabari Smith from Auburn. I watch a lot of college basketball, as you well know. I am an Auburn fan, as you well know. I watched every game this kid played in college. Um, There's no doubt in my mind he is the best player in this year's draft, and I really don't think it's that close. Jabari Smith is the prototypical player for today's NBA game. He's 6'10", he has a lot of potential on defense, can move his feet well, has plenty of uh, room on his body to add strength. He's a tremendous shooter. He shot over 40% from the outside this year for Auburn. He can knock down the contested jump shot. He can hit shots off the screen, off the bounce. And he has a competitive fire. He's a winner. He's a player that wants to win. He's a player that's not afraid of hard work. And he's the best player in this draft. And I got to tell you, um, if the Orlando Magic take anyone other than Jabari Smith, they're really screwing up. They're really screwing up. They're messing things up. I know that drafts are a crapshoot. I know that certain teams like certain guys. They do their best to scout. They they do workouts and then they make a pick and they hope for the best. Jabari Smith is the best. It isn't that close. The second overall pick in this year's draft goes to the Oklahoma City Thunder. And I think they should take the forward Paolo Banchero from Duke. Um, In my estimation... Jabari Smith and Banchero are the two best players in this draft. To me, and this is just me, but to me, it's Jabari Smith, Banchero, and then everybody else. 
I got to see this young man play on several occasions this year. Um, I like the talent that he has. I think he has a lot of room to improve defensively. But I think he can score the ball even at the NBA level. I don't think it's fair to compare him to Marvin Bagley. I don't think that's how his NBA career is going to go. I think he's the second best player in the draft. The third pick in this year's draft goes to the Houston Rockets. And I think they should take Jaden Ivey, the guard from Purdue. Um, Again, we're not looking at roster fit. We're just looking at talent. Who are the best players? I think Jaden Ivey will be able to score at the NBA level. I think he'll be a playmaker. Um, I think he has a lot of room uh, for growth, a lot of potential, and a high ceiling. I've got him as the third best player overall in this year's draft. The fourth pick goes to the Sacramento Kings, and I think they should take the forward, Keegan Murray from Iowa. Aside from Jabari Smith, Keegan Murray was one of my favorite players uh, out of this top 10 to watch in college basketball. He has a smooth game. I like the way that he lets the game come to him. He doesn't force the action. I think that he's a a sleeper in this year's draft. I know that's kind of weird to say from a top 10 player, but I think that he's one of those players that could go anywhere from 5 to 12. Um, But I think he might turn out to be a top 5 player uh, for sure. I would take him 4th overall if I were the Kings. The 5th pick in the draft goes to the Detroit Pistons. And I think they should take the guard, Dyson Daniels, from the G League Ignite. This guy is not projected as a top five pick in most NBA draft previews on most draft boards. Um, But in overall talent, I think he's there. I think he's there. He's got more experience than some of these players coming out of college that only played one year as far as high-end basketball. And I think he has a lot of potential. I would take him fifth overall. With the sixth pick in the draft, the Indiana Pacers should take the forward Chet Holmgren from Gonzaga. Um, I will probably get killed for having him sixth overall. Chet Holmgren is a player that people are considering uh, to be in the top three along with Jabari Smith and Banchero from Duke. Um, Some people are even saying that he should be the number one pick overall with the Orlando Magic. And I'm here to tell you that uh, if the Magic take Chet Holmgren number one overall over Jabari Smith that GM will lose his job I'm just saying I'm not saying I'm just saying Uh, you might come back two or three years from now and this might look like the dumbest thing anybody ever said I just don't see Chet Holmgren as a generational talent at the NBA level he's a good outside shooter He's a decent shot blocker. He has uh, the the frame of an NBA player. But I just think his feet aren't quick enough to guard people on the outside. I don't think he's strong enough to guard people on the inside. I don't see him adding a ton of strength or weight to that body frame. And I don't see the top-tier athleticism. Um, I don't think Chet Holmgren is Kevin Durant. Uh, I think Jabari Smith is a lot closer to Kevin Durant. I don't think Chet Holmgren is Kevin Durant. I'm not saying he won't be a contributor, that he won't turn into a good NBA player, but I watched him a lot at Gonzaga, and he was a good college basketball player, but there were a few nights that he was the best player on the floor. And if I were a top five picking team in this year's NBA draft, I would think long and hard about fit before I picked Chet Holmgren. If you're a team that's rebuilding like the Pacers are, If you're a team that's in a position to pick based on potential, he's worth the top 10 pick. Otherwise, I'm not really sure. The Portland Trailblazers have the 7th overall pick, and I think they should pick the guard slash forward. Benedict Mathruin from Arizona. I probably butchered his name, but I did watch him play a few times this year, and I like his game. Um, I think he's going to be an underrated defender at the NBA level. I think he has a lot of room to develop his offensive game. He's athletic. He's smooth. I think the Portland Trail Blazers would do well to take Benedict Mathruin from Arizona. With the eighth overall pick, the New Orleans Pelicans should take the shooting guard, Shaden Sharp, who is kind of from Kentucky. Um, he never actually suited up for the Wildcats, never played a game, uh, was a very highly touted recruit that reclassified so that he could go to the the Wildcats a year early and then never played and then declared for the draft. Um, 
He looked like an elite player at the high school level. So did Sebastian Telfair. Um, I don't know what to make of Shaden Sharp. I don't know if he's going to be an NBA All-Star. I don't know if he's going to be out of the league in five years. I know he has a lot of potential. I know he's athletic. I know that he is well thought of. And again, he's a player that on potential alone will probably slide into the top 10. And if you're a team like the Pelicans, who is going to have Zion Williamson coming back, that has Brandon Ingram coming off the best year of his career, that now has C.J. McCollum and other young players around them, um, it might be worth a flyer on a guy that could be a high-level NBA scorer. I have him going at 8th. At ninth overall, the San Antonio Spurs have the selection, and I think they should take shooting guard Johnny Davis from Wisconsin. Johnny Davis is everything right with Wisconsin basketball. He's a great fundamental player, a tremendous leader, has good character, uh, can shoot the ball well, is experienced, and would be a great fit with the Spurs organization. Um, He should go ninth overall to San Antonio. And with the 10th pick, the Washington Wizards should take the forward, Jeremy Sochin from Baylor. Uh, this is a guy, in my estimation, that doesn't have the top-end talent like some of these guys in the upper echelon of the top 10. Um, but he's a hard worker. He's certainly talented. Uh, he's got a high motor, uh, to throw in a cliche. And I think that he'll be a good rotation piece in the NBA for several years. Um, If I was a team like the Wizards that's rebuilding and you're looking to add pieces uh, that can contribute, that will play defense, I think a player like Jeremy Sochin would be a tremendous pick. So that's my top 10. Jabari Smith, Banchero, Jaden Ivey, Keegan Murray, Dyson Daniels, Chet Holmgren, Benedict Mathruin, Shaden Sharp, Johnny Davis, and Jeremy Sochin. Again, that's not necessarily how things will turn out, but that's what I'm saying based on talent. Those are my top 10 guys. The draft is tomorrow night. I'll be very interested to see what happens, especially 1 through 5. I want to see what Orlando does. I want to see what Oklahoma City does. Um, I'm interested in the Kings. They always get to pick high. Interested to see what the Trailblazers do because we're not sure if they're going to be able to keep Dame Lillard and uh, see what pieces they put around him. And I just want to throw this out there too. The Warriors have a pick in the first round at 28 overall. And I'm just throwing this out there. Uh, Dub Nation, you should take Bob Myers. You should take uh, Walker Kessler from Auburn. Um, NCAA Defensive Player of the Year. Shot blocker. Catch the oop. Set a good screen. Uh, decent 15-foot jump shot. I think that he would fit well into the system that the Warriors have. He would be good insurance in case uh, Wiseman never quite makes it as far as learning to play alongside Steph and the gang. And a good insurance policy in case you lose Kavon Looney in free agency. I'm just saying. I'm not saying. I'm just saying. Um, So we will take a look at the NBA draft on our next episode. What actually happened, I will be tuning in tomorrow. I can't wait. I am excited. Uh, Email the show. Let me know. Email the show at intheshedwithwes at gmail.com. And tell me how crazy my list is. Tell me uh, who you would have going number one overall if you were the Orlando Magic. Um, Tell me how wrong I am about Chet Holmgren being the sixth overall player in this year's draft. Tell me how crazy I am for thinking that Dyson Davis and Keegan Murray are top five players. Um, Let me know who you hope your team drafts. Email the show at intheshedwithwes at gmail.com. Get at us on Twitter at intheshed 4 We would love to hear from you. That's all for the world of sports. Let's switch to this, the news in the world of the paranormal. And our first story takes us to everywhere. Should we be worried about AI becoming sentient? Uh, Before we even read the article, I'm going to say, yeah, yeah, we should be worried. Have you ever seen iRobot featuring Chris Rock slapping Will Smith? That's an adjective. That's how he's described now. Chris Rock slapping Will Smith. Will Smith is the act. Anyway, yes, we should be worried about an AI takeover. It's coming. A software engineer on Google's artificial intelligence team was suspended by the company earlier this month. 
his offense, sharing confidential information that had led him to believe an AI he had been conversing with had become sentient. Oh boy. The engineer, Blake Lemoyne, reportedly spent months making the case to his colleagues that Google's chatbot generator Lambda, an incredibly complex language model that mimics human conversations, had become so sophisticated that it had actually achieved consciousness. Last week, he published portions of his interactions with Lambda in which the AI wrote that it told him it experiences loneliness, had a fear of death, and stated, I want everyone to understand that I am, in fact, a person. Word? The AI said, I want everyone to understand that I am, in fact, a person. Why has this not been top trending news on CNN, ABC, NBC, MSNBC, and Fox News? This thing said, I want everyone to understand that I am, in fact, a person. That's terrifying. I'm frightened. Google insists that Lambda is not sentient, saying that Lemoyne was anthropomorphizing a system designed to imitate the types of exchanges found in millions of sentences. Most experts agree with the company. Most experts agree. Not all experts agree with the company. <sighs> Arguing that current artificial intelligence models, though becoming more advanced every day, still lack the complex abilities that are typically considered signs of sentience, like self-awareness, intuition, and emotions. Uh, okay, it said that it experienced loneliness, that is, an emotion. It says it has a fear of death, that is, awareness. And it says it wants everyone to understand that it's, an, in fact, a person. I think this thing might be sentient. The idea of AI gaining consciousness has been the source of fascination and fear since the early days of computer programming. Some have imagined utopian societies supported by hyper-intelligent artificial beings. Nah, fam. Others are terrified of a future dominated by machines in which humans are subjugated or even eradicated. Yeah, uh, put me in that camp. I am not one that imagines a utopia, okay? Um, I am one who fears subjugation and eradication. That is me. Don't sign me up for that one. But that is, in fact, the camp where my tent has been pitched. Tesla founder Elon Musk once called AI a fundamental existential risk for human civilization. So, this guy that works at Google, um, he tried to tell all them folk over there that this thing has become sentient. And they were like, mm, nah, we don't believe you. And so he went public with the chat. Hey, this thing is telling me it's afraid of death and that it's lonely and that it wants everyone to realize it is in fact a person. And Google's response is to be like, mm, that's not true. And then fire him. <laughs> Google's like, hey, don't believe that guy. And then they fired him. Um, that kind of makes me believe that guy, Google. Uh, you don't have a lot of goodwill with the public, and you just fired the guy that is uh, trying to be like a whistleblower. Not a good look. And on the one hand, we're kind of already in the throes of an artificial intelligence takeover because we're all slaves to an algorithm. And people talk uh, in fearful terms about basically becoming like a cyborg because... We're on the path where humanity and technology are going to merge in ways that we are not comfortable with. And I'm like, hey, we're actually already there. All of us have this little uh, tiny screen attached to our hand at all times. And we barely put it down. And when we do, it's right next to our heads while we're asleep. And we impulsively pick it up 38 times a day. 
and it has little dings that it makes that grabs our attention. Um, we kind of are already there, okay? And to know that the guy who's in charge of making this Lambda conversational artificial intelligence thing at Google is alarmed and believes that he's become sentient, that's terrifying. That's a whole new level of spooky. That's real freaky deaky type stuff. And it makes me want to get rid of every piece. <laughs> every piece of technology in my house and revert to a flip, phone, a flip phone and smoke signals, okay? Because that scares me. And I will be the character like Will Smith on iRobot. Because I will continue to drive myself. I will not have a robotic assistant. I will play my records and cook my own food and be married to my real actual human wife. Robots, you can't have me. I don't want you. And this story scares me to death. The AI takeover is here and it ain't slowing down. Google trying to be like, hey, there's nothing to see here except that you Lambda chat machine has developed a consciousness, and it has to be stopped. From everywhere we go to the Catholic Church for our next story. Filipino Archbishop, who some claimed had the ability to be in two places at once, moves closer to sainthood. The late Sabueno Archbishop named Teofilo Kamamet was bestowed the title of Venerable by the Pope, on May 21st, a Congress consisting of nine theological consultants unanimously affirmed Kamamet's virtuous life in October of 2021. It was later presented to Pope Francis, who approved Kamamet's heroic virtues after a meeting with the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, Prefect Cardinal Marcelo Somero, on Saturday. Kamamet, who was born on March 3, 1914, became a priest in 1941 before being consecrated as a bishop in 1955. He was known in Cebu for his spiritual gifts. Testimonies reported his ability to levitate in prayer, oh my, to heal the sick, and to buy locate. One of the testimonies is from an archbishop of Cebu, Cardinal Ricardo Vida, who reportedly was with Kamamet on September 27, 1985, during the same time, Kamamet was seen anointing a sick man in a mountain village about 30 miles away. Kamamet died in a car accident at the age of 74 on September 27, 1988. His dedication to the poor and detachment from material possessions were the trademarks of his ministry, said the Archdiocese of Cebu in a statement. The Catholic Church will have to attribute a miracle to Kamamet in order for him to be beatified as blessed. A second miracle is then needed for him to be further canonized as a saint. Um, okay, so a couple of questions here. Um, and I'm not saying that this man did not have the ability to be in two places at one time. Maybe he did. Maybe he just out here just being in several places at once. I don't know. But the reason why people thought he could be in two places at once is because he was with another archbishop and at the same time someone saw him anointing a sick person 30 miles away. Is it possible, and I, I'm just spitballing here, but is it possible that the person that saw him might have just been wrong? <laughs> Maybe they were just wrong. They're like, hey, that's Archbishop Kamamit. Uh, nah, that's just the Archbishop that looks kind of like Kamamet. Um, that's actually Archbishop Johnson. Uh, they got similar looks, but different color eyes. Like, I, I don't know. Um, it just seems more likely to me, rather than the fact that he's able to be in two places at once, uh, it seems more likely to me that maybe that guy was just wrong. Do we know that he has good vision? Has he ever met Archbishop Kamamet before? Um, are there other witnesses to this phenomenon? Do 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 phenomenon. Do 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 phenomenon. Do 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 da 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 da. 
it wasn't in the article. I had to add it. It's been a while. Um, to me, it's it's more believable that the man levitated in prayer, and I've never seen anybody levitate other than uh, Chris Angel, and that was on TV. So I'm not even sure that levitation is a thing. But I, if you told me he could levitate, I would go, "Hey, okay." That seems plausible, that he's in such a deep place in prayer that maybe he was levitating. Um, I think maybe this guy was just wrong. Um, And so, and I hate to talk ill of the dead, but he died in a car accident. Um, If you have the ability to be in two places at once, would you really die in a car accident? Wouldn't you just make yourself be some... (laughs) Wouldn't you just make yourself be somewhere else at that moment instead? Like, ah, ha ha, I was there. Now I'm not. Instead of dying in the car accident. Um, but now he's passed away. Sounds like he was a great guy that did a lot of good work in the community. And they're looking for miracles that he did so they can make him a saint. Like he got to come. They got to come up with two miracles. Hmm, one miracle, two miracles. Then he can be a saint. And. Um, Maybe Mr. Mamamit, Archbishop Mamamit, uh, Kamamit, uh, clean it up with Comet, Earth is my planet. Maybe he will make it. And if he does, then more power to him and the memory of him. But I think maybe the guy that saw him anointing the sick person was just wrong. Probably is my take on it. Uh, yeah. From the Catholic Church to the movie theater, we go for our next story, a review of Jurassic World Dominion. So this is something that we did a lot early on in the show. The first several episodes, we would, uh, during the paranormal segment, review a movie if it was sci-fi, if it was horror-themed, or a TV show or a book that I've been reading And we have kind of gotten away from that. It's been a while since we've done that. I've gotten several messages from you guys uh, requesting that that be a part of the show again. And uh, I happened to see Jurassic World Dominion this last week, so I thought I would give you my impression of it. So if you have not seen it, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, spoiler alert. Okay, let's talk about Jurassic World Dominion. Jurassic World Dominion is rated PG-13, has a runtime of 2 hours and 26 minutes. It has scored an abysmal 30% on Rotten Tomatoes, but has done a little bit better, a 6 out of 10 on IMDb. It stars Chris Pratt, Bryce Dallas Howard, DeWanda Wise, and Isabella Sermon, and also features the return of Laura Dern, Sam Neill, B.D. Wong, and... Jeff Goldblum. So I gave a spoiler alert, but I still don't want to get in too much to the the ins and outs of the plot or specific scenes from the movie, just in case you haven't seen it and are still are planning to. Instead, I will just give you kind of my generalized overall feeling after having seen the movie. Um, I will say my favorite part of the movie was the returning characters. Um... After the original trilogy with uh, Jurassic World, this is the third of those films, it just felt right to kind of blend the old with the new. I actually think that Chris Pratt has done an admirable job in the Jurassic World films, especially in the initial offering, and I thought it was super dope to bring bring back the OGs. Um, to have Laura Dern and Sam Neill and B.D. Wong and especially Jeff Goldblum again in this movie. I thought that it was really neat. Um, I loved the blending between the old and the new. That was my favorite part. I'll be honest, I did think that the story was a little bit clumsy. Um, the plot was a little bit lacking. The action was, of course, good. I did think that it was a fun movie. Um, it was a little bit too long. It was a little bit too long. Some movies are two hours and 26 minutes and they don't feel like it. This one felt like it. Uh, This movie felt like it was two hours and 45 minutes long. Uh, They probably could have cut it by about 20 minutes and it would have been helpful. Um, 
Returning characters were cool, story was clumsy, the movie was too long. But overall, I have to say I thought it was enjoyable. This is a movie that uh, critics will hate. And I think if you're a fan of Jurassic Park, most people will like the movie. Um, On a scale of 1 to 5, with 1 being this movie should have never been made in the first place, and 5 being this movie is flawless, I give it a 3.75 stars. 3.75. This movie is far from a cinematic masterpiece, But if you can just go to the movies and have fun and sit back and enjoy the film in front of you, enjoy the action scenes, enjoy the dinosaurs, enjoy the -the over-the-topness, enjoy the ridiculousness, have fun going back to your childhood when the original Jurassic Park movies came out, which is what I did, then I think you'll have a good time. I think you'll like the movie. Um, my friends are kind of mixed, honestly. Uh, what I see online is kind of mixed. Some people really enjoyed it, some people hated it. What did you think about the movie? What do you think about my rating, 3.75 stars? Not a great film, but one that I liked. Um, email the show at intheshedwithwes at gmail.com. Get at us on Twitter at intheshed4. I would love to hear what you think. Did you enjoy the film? Did you like the callback with the original actors? Uh, Were you too distracted by a lack of plot? Did you think that this was a a suitable finish to the series? I would love to hear from you, and uh, something that we'll continue to do on the show is to review applicable movies, books, and TV shows. I actually have a TV show that I'm going to talk about on next week's show and go in depth about that I've been watching, and I hope that you will look forward to that. And for our last story in the world of the paranormal, we go from the movies... To the wilderness, where we investigate together the phenomenon of feral children. This is the real life Mowgli. The story from Jungle Book isn't fiction. It's based on a real person, a real man cub. When Rudyard Kipling wrote the Jungle Book in 1894, few understood where his inspiration originated from. The story follows the journey of a wild boy called Mowgli who grew up among wolves without any human contact. While the friendship with Baloo the bear and facing off against the tiger Shere Khan were fictionalized, the tale of a feral boy walking on all fours and under the care of wild beasts was not. In Jungle Book, Mowgli eventually finds a human village and makes a decision to return to his own people. And while the real Mowgli did make his way back to civilization, It was not quite the same happy ending. This is the story of the real-life Mowgli, the story of Dina Sanachar. In February 1867, a group of hunters were scouring the hills of Boldashar in Uttar Pradesh in search of prey. They came to a cave, and what they found shocked them. It was not a small deer they saw, but a small boy, and he was surrounded by what looked like a pack of wolves. He was only around six years old and was sleeping amongst the wolves as though he was really a man cub. The hunters, concerned for the boy's safety, decided to carry him out of the cave, but they soon discovered that he could not speak or understand what they were saying. All he did was growl and look at them with sad eyes as though he was being taken away from his family. The boy was taken to Sikandra Mission Orphanage and it was assumed that his parents had been killed by the wolves he was sleeping with. Appearing malnourished and stunted, he was given some food, but he would not eat anything, not even a morsel. He was given the name Sanachar, but throughout his life he could not even say his own name. That's because the orphanage staff soon realized that this was not just any orphan, he was a feral child. A child that had grown up with no human contact and was incapable of speech. There comes a critical point in a child's development where if language is not learned by a certain age he can no longer learn to speak. Unfortunately for Sanachar, he had gone past this point, and all he did was growl and occasionally bark like a dog. He didn't make any human friends at the orphanage, and his only friend was a real dog with whom he'd share raw meat. It was only when another feral child came in that Sanachar made any effort to know other humans. He walked on all fours, only ate raw meat, and was most comfortable not with humans but with other wild animals. Despite their best efforts, the orphanage staff were unable to civilize him. Whatever food was presented, no matter how delicious it looked, Sanachar would first smell it, 
and if it wasn't raw, refused to eat it. And when he did eat meat, he'd keep the bones and gnaw at them for hours. Some weren't sure why, but it's likely that he did this to sharpen his teeth the same way a wolf would. Sanachar did eventually go on to live with humans for over 20 years, but he never learned to speak and remained dependent on the goodwill of others. He was seriously impaired and perhaps suffering from depression took on the habit of smoking. He was a heavy smoker and perhaps the only thing that kept him going. But it was also the one thing that ended him. Sanachar died of tuberculosis in 1895, lonely and confused. No one could ever understand what he was thinking all those years. Did he yearn for his wolf family? Was he afraid of what people around him were thinking and saying? We'll never know, as he never learned to communicate, not even in sign language. Sanachar was a feral child, but he was not the only person to have been raised by wolves. There are countless stories of abandoned children being raised by wild animals. Some were unavoidable, but some were the result of parental negligence. We'll never know the true story of why Sanachar grew up among wolves. We don't even know what his real name was. Whether he was abandoned as a baby or made an orphan, his story tells us the importance of providing love and care to children from an early age. Sanachar never got that. Perhaps he received love from his wolf family, but perhaps he could never view humans in the same way. It's a sad tale, but a true one. We should always be grateful that no matter how difficult our lives are, at least we're able to communicate with each other. At least we grew up surrounded by human contact and we had shelter. Because unlike us, not everyone is so privileged. Even aside from the story of the real-life Mowgli, there are other famous feral children from history. From a wild boy kept as a pet in King George's court to an Indian who was supposedly raised by wolves, These are the puzzling and often tragic stories of five famous feral children. Number one, John of Liege. One of the earliest English language accounts of a feral child concerns one of the earliest English language accounts of a feral child concerns John of Liege, a boy who supposedly spent most of his youth in isolation in the Belgian wilderness. According to a 1644 account by Sir Kenelm Digby, John first fled to the woods at the age of five to escape enemy soldiers during a religious war. While his family and the rest of his village returned to their homes after the danger had passed, young John was too terrified to come out of hiding. He struck off alone into the depths of the forest, where he survived for 16 years on roots and wild berries. John finally returned to society at age 21 when he was caught trying to steal food from a local farm. By then he was reportedly naked and all overgrown with hair, and had quite forgotten the use of all language. Most astonishing of all, his years in the bush had led him to develop a dog-like sense of smell, allowing him to sniff out food from great distances. According to Digby, John eventually began talking again, but his heightened senses dulled once he was back in civilization. Number 2. Peter the Wild Boy In the summer of 1725, a naked and mute adolescent boy was found living alone in the woods of northern Germany. The child was brought before the British king, George I, who took a liking to him and had him shipped to his court. Christened Peter, the boy soon became the toast of London, and he was regularly trotted out as a party favor to entertain royal guests. Nobles were fascinated by the wild boy's habit of scurrying about on all fours, and they laughed at his disregard for table manners, and his penchant for picking pockets and trying to kiss ladies of the court. Attempts to civilize Peter failed. He never learned to speak and preferred to sleep on the floor, so he was eventually sent to the countryside where he lived until his death in 1785. By then, Peter had inspired comment and speculation from the likes of Daniel Defoe and Jonathan Swift, but the full story of how he came to live in the woods has never been revealed. Some researchers have since argued that he may have been Abandoned because he suffered from Pitt-Hopkins syndrome, a rare neurological disorder characterized by learning disabilities and an inability to develop speech. Number 3. Marie-Angelique Mamie Leblanc In 1731, the French village of Sanji was stunned by sightings of a wild young woman armed with a wooden club. This savage girl of Champagne was clad in animal skins and a tattered dress, and appeared to be anywhere from 10 to 18 years old, depending on the source. She was also astonishingly strong for her size, and had once even killed a local guard dog with her club. 
When villagers finally lured the young woman out of the trees, they were amazed to discover that she only spoke in animalistic whoops and squeaks and preferred to eat raw meat, often skinning and biting into the carcass of a fresh kill on the spot. In time, the girl learned to speak French and grew more civilized, and she was later baptized under the name Marie-Angelique Mamie LeBlanc and sent to live in a convent. Further details about her background would never emerge until 1765 when she told an interviewer that she had escaped to the forest after being kidnapped and brought to Europe as an enslaved worker. Many of Mamie's contemporaries believe that she was originally Inuit, but recent researchers suggest that she was most likely a Meskwaki Indian born in what is now Wisconsin. Number 4. Victor of Avaron The mysterious story of Victor began in 1800 when a boy around 12 years old was found wandering in the woods near Avaron, France. The wild child was naked and mute, and an abundance of scars seemed to indicate that he had been exposed to the elements since a very young age. He refused to be washed or touched, ignored human contact, and often exploded in violent outbursts. Years of isolation had led him to develop a remarkable form of selective hearing. The boy might ignore the sound of a pistol fired behind his head, but would perk up immediately at the cracking of a walnut, one of his favorite foods. French officials deemed the child an imbecile, but a consultant to a school for the deaf named Jean-Marc Gaspard Attard believed that it was possible to teach him language. Attard worked with the boy whom he named Victor for several years, and eventually got him to bathe, wear clothes, and even show signs of empathy. Language, however, proved to be permanently beyond the boy's grasp. While Latard taught Victor to understand basic spoken questions and commands, the foundling died at the age of 40, having never uttered a complete sentence. Number 5. Kaspar Hauser On May 26, 1828, a teenage boy appeared in Nuremberg, Germany with a seemingly unbelievable story. Identifying himself as Kaspar Hauser, the youth said he had spent the previous 13 years confined to a small room, his only companions a few wooden toys, and a mysterious man that appeared each day to bring him food and water. He carried with him two cryptic notes which claimed he had come into the captor's care as a child and had never been allowed to leave the house, but was now being released to pursue a military career. Hauser's macabre tale quickly catapulted him to instant fame across Europe. Many marveled at the foundling's oddities. He supposedly possessed remarkable night vision and often fell into a stupor when presented with new experiences, but others suspected his story might be a hoax. The boy had learned language and writing too easily, they argued, and his complexion was not pale enough for someone who had spent most of his life in darkness. The situation only grew more bizarre in 1833 when Hauser died from a mysterious, possibly self-inflicted stab wound. Dozens of wild theories have since been proposed about his origins, including that he was actually a royal who was confined as part of a conspiracy to prevent him from taking the throne. To this day, however, it is unclear whether Caspar Hauser was a real-life wild child or merely a skilled con man. So, I thought that this was um, incredibly interesting. Um, the phenomenon of feral children. And... It's very interesting to me that so many of these take place in the 16, 17, and 1800s and makes me wonder how many of these situations may have to do with mental health issues or issues of learning disabilities and, and things that were not able to be diagnosed at the time. Um, but no doubt there have been children that have wound up either because of parental neglect or because of catastrophe or accident. Children that have wound up in the wild. And they have been um, taken care of by animals, maybe even raised to a certain extent by animals. Um, they have had to adapt to their surroundings in order to survive and have taken on animalistic behaviors. Um, I had no idea that the story of Mowgli in the Jungle Book was based on a real life, um, a real life person. And it's really based on a very sad situation. The story of Sinachar. Um, if I even just said his name right, I forget if that's the right way to say it, but, uh, a very sad, sad situation. Uh, this poor kid, however, he wound up being taken care of by wolves and he was never able, uh, to become a person. He was taken to an orphanage. He didn't receive proper care. He never learned how to speak. He lived his life, um, alone and depressed and died at a young age. That's tragic. Um... 
not the happy ending that we see in the Jungle Book. And this kind of thing happens uh, even today. Um, I remember uh, back when I worked out in Colorado, one of my favorite places and one of the best summers of my life. For my senior year of college, I did a summer uh, internship out in Colorado. And uh, one of the folks that I knew out there worked in social services and um, had a very wide uh, geographical area that she was responsible for covering. And I remember uh, she had to make a house call out in the middle of nowhere. And I mean in the middle of nowhere in the mountains. And what they found was uh, children that were living in disrepair and whose parents were not taking care of them and whose parents were neglecting them in ways that were uh, just horrific. Uh, Mistreating these children, treating them like animals. And there was a child that was like six or seven years old that had not learned to talk at all and that could barely walk. And it kind of walked hunch, uh, hunched over like the chickens because a lot of the time it's spent in the chicken coop with the chickens. And it would do this sort of pecking motion like the chickens. And uh, I'll never forget hearing that story um, about a kid like that and about the circumstances that led to the child taking on this animalistic behavior. It's absolutely heartbreaking. It's absolutely heartbreaking. In this story of Sinachar, I wonder how he got to that cave with those wolves. I wonder what set of circumstances led to that. And I wonder why the wolves took care of this baby, this human child, rather than eating him alive. Rather than just leaving him and abandoning him to die. They took care of him. They cared for him. They didn't hurt him. It's always amazing. You see these stories of uh, children that fall into gorilla enclosures at the zoo and the gorilla goes and makes sure that the others don't hurt it and and cradles and takes care of it um it's very interesting to me and uh there is this phenomenon throughout history of feral children of children that have been raised in 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 the the woods children that have been raised by animals children that have been incredibly resilient and have had to do things that you can't even imagine just to survive And that's where the Jungle Book comes from. And I had no idea. And probably you didn't have any idea that that was a real thing. But it is. And it's terribly interesting. And it's terribly tragic. And it's where we end our show tonight. That's all for this week. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. I can't either. It's back in the house and out of the shed for me. Thanks again for listening to episode 42 Make sure to subscribe, like, share, and review. It really does help. If you have any paranormal experiences, opinions about sports or politics that you'd like to share, you can email the show at intheshedwithwes at gmail.com. Again, that's intheshedwithwes at gmail.com. I might even read it on air. Look for us on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, the Good Pods app, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to follow us on Twitter at intheshed 4 Tune in again next week when we'll hit the headlines, talk NBA draft, and investigate together the philosophy of Thursdayism. This has been In the Shed with Wes Anderson, the best new show in the land covering politics, sports, and the paranormal. Have an adventurous and fulfilling weekend. I'll catch you tools later. Peace out, Boy Scout. Meemaw, we made it!